All right, so we are in part 10 of our continuing series, and the title of the series is, Is Sanctification Progressive? And this is part 10 of that. And um, the last few messages, the subtitle has been, Sin in the Life of the Believer. So the last message we were continuing to look at this idea of <clears throat> the power of sin. We had talked about how a lot of people in messages uh, talk about the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and the presence of sin. Penalty was dealt with at the cross, and the power of sin, usually when that conversation takes place, deals with what we're talking about, sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. And then the presence of sin, which we will be removed from the presence of sin in glorification. And so we examined that subject in the light of Romans 6 and Romans 7, talked about it. And there was a phrase used in both of those chapters that sin will not have dominion over you. And that phrase, those three words, have dominion over we mentioned that it, it means to rule, to lord, to be lord of, exercise lordship over. So, of course, with that, with that definition, we recognize some of the language of this system that we've been talking against, which is really a misnomer. On their part, they call it lordship salvation. And uh, so what we're trying to talk about in this series, and, and really all that we talk about is real lordship salvation by the Lord our righteousness. And so we've been seeking to correct um, really the majority of teaching that's out there on the Christian life that tends to be legalistic. And we're doing that for the sake of the glory of God, for the sake of uh, our assurance of salvation, which is a which is a big deal. Now, what this means is, and we talked about it last week and probably the week before, that there is therefore now no condemnation. And condemnation is connected to the law or sin. In other words, it's a legal thing that legally there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8.1. So again, this is, this is real lordship salvation, not the current fake legalistic lordship salvation. And it has to do with the truth of, not, uh, of sin not having dominion over believers in this legal sense. So believers are justified, they're set apart holy in Christ, they're no longer under the law, they're no longer under condemnation. And now by faith, and that's what the justified live by, is by faith, we are to, and this is a quote from Romans 6.11, we are to count ourselves to be truly dead to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That idea of count, the same word impute. So in our minds, by faith, because God has... We do the same thing. We count ourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So in other words, we, by faith, we see ourselves like God sees us. And if we, and if we can't do that, we're just going to have fear, guilt, condemnation, un, unbelief. And of course, Paul, here in Romans 6, says... Um, you know, if you believe the gospel, this is what you are to automatically do, is count yourselves to be truly dead to sin. Also, this harmonizes well with Ephesians 4.24 that says, um, as a result of that other verse, you should put on the new man who, according to God, was created in righteousness and true holiness. So they use that word true holiness. Sometimes when it talks about when God in his word talks about himself, he talks about that he is the true God. 
In other words, opposed to idols. So when we talk about holiness or righteousness, sometimes the scripture kind of is redundant and says we're talking about true holiness and true righteousness, not this, not this fake pretend stuff that religious people do. That you put on, those four words, that you put on, what it means is to invest with clothing, to array or clothe with in the sense of sinking into a garment. So this is something that we have, and it's saying, put this on in your mind by faith. And it's just like the other verse that we read, count yourselves, etc. So it talked about there in Romans 6.11, count yourselves to be dead to sin. So can we just as well say, as believers, count yourselves to be truly holy or set apart by God in Christ? Of course we can say that. And it's what we should be saying. Because that's what true holiness is. Is to be set apart by God in Christ. Let's turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. Start reading in verse 13. Now, of course, the subject of sanctification of the Spirit is just one part of the threefold aspect of sanctification that is Trinitarian, right? The Father sanctifies us by love and election. Christ sanctifies us by His blood. And the Spirit sanctifies us by regenerating us, dwelling in us, and the, the belief of the truth. The Word of God is a means in that. And of course, remember in Acts 26, we talked about how Christ was talking to Paul right at his conversion and talked about, you're, talk to these people, you're going to preach to these people that are sanctified by faith in me. So faith is involved here in this aspect of sanctification in our lifetimes. And so we've been starting to get into the idea of, okay, so now what does this look like in our life? And how are we to think about it? And then we always go back to, unless we believe the gospel first and have a gospel mindset and realize what the ground is before we take the first step to do anything God instructs us, we have to have this gospel aspect and this gospel foundation clear before that we even start to act concerning any instruction. And we can't do it with the clothing of the old man and the mindset of the old man, which is legalism, self-righteousness. So we're going to, again, the subtitle, Sin in the life of the believer. So how do, we, how do we live, how do we do things with the mindset of God's free and sovereign grace? Verse 13. Therefore, girding up the loins of your mind, be sober. Let me just stop there. Now this is not, some people would read this, well this is talking about don't be a drunk. Well, it could include that, but Overall, we are to live sober-mindedly and not, not act in our minds, even if we don't drink, not act in our minds like we're drunk, as far as like being foolish, lackadaisical, not thinking correctly. So uh, be sober. It's talking about like having a, have a, a spiritual alertness to our minds with an understanding, to think biblically, right? Be sober, perfectly hope for the grace being brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Now, let's, let's have a refresher here concerning the use of several different words that we've talked about throughout. Like, for example, the flesh. The flesh is used several different ways. The idea of lust is used several different ways. Other words like that are used in a multiplicity of ways in different contexts. And we know that when it comes to flesh and lust, it could be talking about immorality, 
It could be talking about religious sins of self-righteousness, pride, leaning on the arm of the flesh when it comes to a conditional salvation. And what is that? That's idolatry, right? That's spiritual fornication, right? So all these things could be in play. And in all the instruction, depending on the context, sometimes it gets explicit and deals with specific things. Other times it deals with the other side. And sometimes we can say, well, it's obviously either one is wrong, either immoral or religious sins. Verse 14, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves. We just read that. According to the former lust in your ignorance. So, knowledge replaced the former ignorance, right? And then we grow in that knowledge. But according, verse 15, to the Holy One who has called you, you also become holy in all conduct. So here is a, this is clear as a bell. This is saying, all right, you are already safe. You are a believer. You're justified. You're sanctified. The Spirit's working in you. Both the will and do of His good pleasure. Um, the Spirit will continue to work in a person until the day of, uh, of glorification, until the day of Christ. We are to follow through with all this, this instruction in a gospel platform by the right motive, under the right incentive, and so on. We've gone over that. We've worn that out. We need to continue to remind ourselves of this. So it explicitly says, be holy, or in other words, separate. Now that you have knowledge and you're no longer ignorant of the wrong way to do it, now you have knowledge and you're going forward and your focus is Christ. Your focus is the gospel. In other words, the just shall live by faith. Right? Now, there's a because here, which is connected to the sentence before that. Because it is written, this is why uh, Peter is saying this, because as it is written in the Old Testament, be holy for I am holy. So the idea here is, uh, I'm gonna, I had this actually up in my notes and I skipped over it, but here's the point. Some of this instruction clearly by not just Peter, but some of the other apostles is telling us to be what we already are, right? Be your identity. We're identified in Christ. We're not, we don't even identify in ourselves anymore. We've been removed from the world's way of thinking about salvation. We've been pulled from, set, set apart from idolatry and this spiritual fornication. Touch not the unclean thing, right? And this is primarily talking about spiritual fornication and idolatry. We've been given repentance from that. And we have a new identity. And we are told to be holy. And that's what we already are. We already saw where we could say we, we count ourselves to be dead to sin. So we count ourselves to be holy because God says we are. Upon the authority and the promise of God saying that this is what he has done, we can on his authority count that for ourselves. Now, of course, in our everyday life, we don't feel holy. Are you going to bank on your feelings at any given time? You better not. Because your feelings come and your feelings go. You can go through circumstances. You can be on medication. You can get yourself in a bind. And uh, if you count on your feelings, you're in trouble. Our focus is on the promises of God in Christ. So he tells us to be 
what we already are in reference to our identity. And that's what faith does. And whatever is not of faith is sin, which is related to some form of unbelief. So, be holy because I'm holy. We, we, see other, we see other texts and verses and contexts where it talks about walk worthy of what you are already. Don't conduct yourself in such a way that you'll bring shame and reproach upon the Lord Jesus Christ, His church, or whatever. This is, this is common sense, basic biblical thinking. Now, how you go about to do that is, is the point of the whole series because other groups will beat you to death with the law, will cause you to doubt and fear. And of course, that's why we're, we're getting a grip on this subject here. Verse 17, And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons, judges according to the work of each one, pass the time of your earthly residence in fear knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, uh, such as silver and gold, from your vain manner of life handed down from your fathers. But what were you redeemed by? With the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. There's our foundation. There's where we're resting. We are resting and we are sure and certain of our foundation as we step out to act, to be active in this Christian life, whether it be in the church, whether it be in the workplace, whether it be in the home, whether it be out going to a grocery store, be on vacation, doesn't matter. This is our foundation that's sure, that never changes. Indeed, having, verse 20, Indeed, having been foreknown before the foundation of the world, but revealed in these last times for you, those believing in God through Him, He who raised Him up from the dead and gave Him glory, so that your faith and hope might be in God. Purifying your souls in the obedience of the truth through the Spirit to unfeigned love of the brothers, love one another fervently out of a pure heart. So, this is the work of the Spirit in time, in the life of the believer, because of what Christ did for the elect. And this is uh, the activity of the Spirit in regeneration and dwelling and the renewing of the mind, right? And so this is the sanctification that we're talking about. We are set apart by the Spirit and we stay, we stay in that position. We stay sanctified. We remain sanctified. We don't become unsanctified. Whether we do good or bad, we stay saints. We don't become super saints. There's no levels of saints. There's levels of growth. We're going to be talking about growth and grace. But saints grow. People don't grow into saints. You don't grow to attain sainthood and so on. So we have to have these things clear. Notice this, having been born again, verse 23, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the living word of God and abiding forever. For all flesh is grass and all the glory of men as the flower of grass and the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God endures forever and this is the word preached as the gospel to you. God's 
gospel of free and sovereign grace that the Spirit uses to uh, in, in the new birth. And then it, it's redundant here and said this, this word is the same thing as the gospel. It is the gospel. Believe what God said that you already are. Count yourselves to be truly dead to sin and set apart to God in Christ. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Sin in the life of the believer. Now, think of this in the context when we read this. Kind of touching back on the idea of the power of sin. So depending on what your view of sanctification is in this lifetime, you're going to hear different groups talk about this issue of the power of sin. What does that look like? Verse 50. 1 Corinthians 50. I say this, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I speak a mystery to you. We shall not all fall asleep, but we shall all be changed. Uh, a lot of times this is read at funerals, and usually there's not much explanation at funerals of what this, what's being said here in, in any context, especially a gospel context. But it... The word that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death, and this is why I brought us here, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. So, our subtitle, Sin in the Life of the Believer, and our subject that we kind of left off with the last few messages is the power of sin. Does sin have power in the life of the believer? And what does all, all that mean? So this word here in this uh, verse 56, the strength, referring to power, the strength of sin is the law. Now, well, let me read these last two verses and I'll make some comments. But thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through our law keeping, our steady progressive improvement of law keeping, our desire of law keeping, our sincerity of law keeping, or obedience or commands or, or whatever. No, but thanks be unto God who God who he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. His person and His work. That's where the victory is. In First John, it talks about this is the this is the victory. Faith is the victory over the world. Faith in Christ. He won the victory. So that is where our faith is directed. It's not directed inside of us. Our performance, our progression, anything about us, because salvation is of the Lord and not anything to do with what we do to obtain or maintain or finally finish it out. So that, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not without fruit in the Lord. So to repeat this idea of concerning this victory, being dead to sin, and so on, the strength of sin is the law, right? Believers are under the dominion of not the law, but under the dominion of grace. God's free and sovereign grace, the only kind of grace there is. Let's look at um, Romans 8. I was just going to quote the 
no condemnation, verse 1, but let's, let's read a few more verses. Romans 8, starting in verse 1. With these ideas in mind, you know, we, we keep reading these words like um, dominion, um, rule, reign, power, strength, and all these things. And, you know, they're all related in the context of how we interpret these things and, and what we have in Christ and how we are to view ourselves and each other in Christ as we walk in the Spirit and live by faith. Verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, before we go any further, we, we've, we've come to Romans 8 many times throughout the years. And, it's, and my goal here today is not to do a verse-by-verse -verse study. I'm going to read these first four verses. <clears throat> I'm not going to get wild here and get very detailed. But I just want to read through here and just mention this. That depending on one's view of, first of all, the gospel which will affect your view on sanctification. If you have a wrong view of sanctification, you're going to read this first section of Romans 8, and you're going to either look at, it's going to talk about flesh. So we're going to look at, when it talks about flesh here, we're either going to look at the immorality or the religious, right? Right? If you have a wrong view of sanctification, you're going to make flesh here everything to do with immorality. And that is not what Romans 8 is talking about here. It's talking about the gospel and your life in the gospel concerning that has been cast off. And you don't think that way anymore. Your identity has been changed. And primarily because there's therefore no, now no condemnation and, and we walk in the Spirit and the Spirit testifies of Christ. But the false Spirit testifies of yourself and you're always looking to yourself, which is what? Flesh. <laughs> we don't walk in the flesh. So a person either is walking according to the flesh or they're not. They don't flip back and forth. So here's a counter idea. But the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. Similar language to what we just read and what we've been reading. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemn sin in the flesh so that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. So a simple question. What is it to walk according to the flesh? Simply put, it is to be a self-righteous, legalistic, unbeliever who has confidence in the flesh for acceptance to God by conditioning salvation on what they do good and stop doing bad. I mean, that's it. That's walking in the flesh. That's considered leaning on the arm of the flesh. That is not resting in Christ. This is what the natural man does he, uh, operating on his defiled conscience and he's looking to himself, bottom line. Conditioning salvation on his behavioral modification. Is it being adjusted in a progressive right direction? Is it going upward? And those that have a wrong view of sanctification would say you have no right to even say you're a believer unless you have that upward, continual, progressive, slow incline of improvement in your obedience. And that is the validation, they say, 
that you're saved. Otherwise, you have no warrant or right to even claim to be a Christian. This is what's said all the time. This is what is not only said by these false teachers, but this is what is believed by human beings that we should have compassion for and that we should continue to warn. And these are the people's lives when they listen to the false teachers, the wolves in sheep's clothing, that their lives are ruined and they live all their days in fear, guilt, and condemnation in their minds because they're walking according to the flesh or the false teacher, especially the false teacher has preached this false doctrine to them as a means to get their, get their brains all scrambled up in false doctrine. Now, we know also that believers, true believers, can get off track and be thrown off temporarily, can be bewitched by false teaching. And this, of course, is why um, some of the apostles write here and warn of many different forms of false teaching. And talk about, watch out for these false teachers. And talk about marking these false teachers and, and avoiding them and so on. So this is about our identity in Christ. And that will determine how you think and what you believe. And what you think and what you believe will affect your whole life in what you think in regards to how you live in this Christian life and when you encounter sin, how do you deal with it? Sin in the life of the believer. Now we've already clearly seen, in, um, especially in Romans 7, for example, that the Scriptures teach that there's this remaining principle of sin that will be at war with, as it says in Romans 7, the inner man for the rest of our lives. Paul is clear, crystal clear on that. Speaking as a born-again believer, not talking about his past life, he's talking about present, dealing with this wretched man that he's dragging around with him, this body of death. So, the series is... is is, is brought to us here to, to cause us to think, how do we deal with this continual war? So we, we've talked a little bit about repentance uh, throughout the many years here. And we want to ask some questions because when these people that, that teach this false view of sanctification, of course, we see that they press conditions in the form of threats, right? And then they judge by whatever subjective standard, depending on what denomination, uh, of, of when they would write you off. And of course, what they end up doing, we know, we see, we've talked about it, that they are judging by the law, not the gospel. And so the, the idea of repentance really comes into play a lot and we've made that distinction concerning initial repentance, concerning what gospel you believe, what Christ you trust. So there's that initial repentance that's given to acknowledge the truth of the gospel, the true Christ, and to rest in Him and reject your false profession of your false Christ that you held to, that you counted on, that you invested in. And that false Christ would allow you to look inside and, and use what's inside as part of your plea at judgment or even currently. And there's, of course, some level of assurance connected to your plea and your mindset of how you're thinking. So this is why it's so important. This is like re real time, real people, real, you know, 
people claiming to be Christian, whether some claim and are not, and whether those that are true claim and are. How do we deal with all these things? So repentance, for example. Initial and even ongoing. So in the, in the form of threats of the wrong view, the legalistic view, they would lean on this idea of examining your repentance. And of course, some people, even in initial salvation, I remember when I made one false profession, I heard a sermon on repentance. It was pretty much a lordship sermon. I walked down the aisle, and um, my second false profession, it's like, I guess I haven't repented right or repented enough because according to what he said in the message, I'm continuing to sin, so something's messed up with my repentance. Did this, uh, you know, sinner's prayer thing again? It wasn't long. Something's still wrong with my repentance, you know? So he was preaching a, a, a legal repentance. Uh, a repentance based on fear under the law that he never dealt with satisfaction of the law that we're in this body of death that will continually be breaking the law until we die every day the war so conditional repentance right some people flat out, even some that claim to be Sovereign Grace Catholic Reform, talk about repentance and faith like it is what is the catalyst that makes things happen. Like you believe in order to be saved, or you repent in order to be forgiven, and so on. So here's some, here's some questions that are... Um, they're kind of absurd so you can see the silliness in them but some seem to imply this when they're talking about repentance and I think I've offered up some of these questions before just to get us to think But so here's the question concerning Christ's death his work did Christ die only for the sins that the elect have stopped Sounds like a weird question. But if you listen to some teaching on sanctification, you'd think, well, that's what they're saying. He only died for the sins that you have stopped committing. Because what they say, if you don't stop committing certain sins and you continue to sin in those sins, you're not saved. You see the silliness there, but do you see how, what, what they're saying when they say what they're saying? You get, you, you're asking this question. Christ died for all the sins of all the elect completely. We, we know that in, uh, in James it says, the book of James, for whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. James 2.10. In other words, the whole law as a unit. So you can wipe off that first part. Whoever shall keep the whole law, if you commit one offense, you're not keeping the whole law to begin with. It is a whole unit. Now, as I said in times past, too, I want to reiterate this. It's not my notes, but this, um, I think this is important. Some who talk about law, like what is the connection of the law in the life of the believer? I know some would press the law is the rule of life for the believer, which I did a standalone message on what is the rule of life for the believer. And I concluded from the scripture that the law is not the rule of life for the believer. But the rule of life of the believer is, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Which, what is this, what's synonymous with that? Faith. Faith is the rule of life for the believer. Faith is what we walk by and live in and live by. 
So faith looks to Christ, rests in Christ. That's our rule. All of life. And whatever is not of faith is sin. So if I take if if a believer is pulling away from faith and investing in something like law, scripture, first of all, scripture says, and the law is not of faith, right? In Galatians. That should be a clear, a, a, a clear on its face warning concerning what is the rule of the life of the believer. But we see here that, for example, if a, if a person sins at least... Well, uh, let me go back. So, some would look at this law thing and this whole law argument and say, well, the old covenant law was threefold as far as the uses of the law. You know, the um, civil, the ceremonial, and the moral. And when you talk about law, you got to talk about the whole law. Now, I had said we should not be afraid to say, well, let's go ahead and separate those three parts and let's just talk about what some would call the moral law. I'm not afraid to talk about that and still talk about what I'm talking about and still defeat their argument. I'm not afraid of it. We shouldn't run from this supposed boogeyman. We should chase after it because we have the gospel. Right? So I'm not afraid to look at instruction that might include children obey your parents, um, believers don't commit adultery. I'm not afraid of looking, you know, he that steals, steal no more. That's in the New Testament. And I'm not going to say, well, you know what, that was part of the, the Old Covenant, and therefore it's, it's abrogated in the same sense that it's abrogated with the civil and ceremonial. I just come to the New Testament and it says, we're not under law. We are not under the dominion of law. Our righteousness, first of all, can never come from the law. It's clear, it's repeated. Christ is the end of law for righteousness' sake. You go to Romans 3.31. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish it. What we just read in Romans 8 talks about filling the righteous requirement of the law in us. Not by us, not by what we do, not even by us looking inside and saying, yeah, i got assurance because I'm keeping the law. That is not it. It's looking to Christ who was born under the law, who kept the law, who magnified the law, who satisfied the law. And that is where we rest. That's what holy people do. And that is our holiness in Christ. So take their view and just, you know, think about it practically. We've talked about this before. If a person would admit that they, that they at least sin once a day, we see that they are breaking the whole, according to James 2.10, they're breaking the whole law every day. Now I think even the, the people that have the wrong view about sanctification would say, yeah, I sin every day. And then they talk about this repentance thing like it's conditional, and we, gotta, we should say to them, so is your repentance broke? Right? They talk about a change of mind leads to a change of behavior. How come your behavior is bad every day if you sin every day and are breaking the law? So they cannot see this with gospel lenses because they have to leave something left undone that is brought inside to have something in form of a plea well, you know, I did this during my Christian life, but Lord, Lord, didn't I do this? And so on. That is always the automatic response as they're on that self-righteous treadmill. So if a person uh, is, is more transparent, they admit, I sin more than once a day, which means 
I break the whole law more than once a day. Right? So everyone that is a that is a true believer is caused to know that they sin every day. They break they are currently law breakers. But if we have the gospel mindset, we're reminded over and over again, we are not under the law. We're under grace. And this has to do with dominion, power, strength, identity. So tie it to sanctification, and it's like, okay, we've said this on the onset of this, you're either sanctified or you're not. There's no in-between. As we live this Christian life, we start out already sanctified. We don't start to try to progress to, in the end, become a saint like, like Rome teaches. That's wickedness. And we, and we know that, like um, Colossians um, 2.13, it ends with having forgiven you all your trespasses. So we start out as a believer already forgiven, not hoping that as we progress, we're progressing to make up for all the sins. That It's, it's not an on-earth current purgatory. That, that form of repentance looks like the Catholic penance. It's like a payback thing. We don't, we're not, we're not uh, working to pay off our debt. So now if we are only forgiven some of our trespasses, which a trespass would be a transgression of the law, then we're not going to look very well at judgment. Because the other trespasses that you're not forgiven of will be required in the form of justice, which means you're not going to make it. So some might say, but we're forgiven only of the sins we repent of. So you have this mindset, you've been in different denominations, you know, you have these groups that believe you can lose your salvation. And if they, if they die while they're sinning, they don't have a chance to repent, right? Or if you sin and you, and you don't hurry up and repent and maybe you get lackadaisical throughout the day and it's like, I usually save my repentance time during my prayer time at night. And if I die before I get to that point, it does not work that way. And these questions or statements might seem silly. I've heard this all my life and I think maybe some of you had too. They might say that we're only forgiven of the sins we confess. And they'll run to 1 John, last few verses in that, and they'll make that verse conditional. If we confess our sins, He's just and faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So they'll tie in repentance and confession and say these two things are, con are conditional. And if you die on the other side of you know, not repenting or not confessing, you're going to end up in the eternal condemnation. And that's, of course, this is uh, anti-Christ thought. It's anti-gospel. It's anti-grace. They might go further and say, we're not forgiven of the sins that we sin willfully. We've talked about this whole willful sin thing. We looked at Hebrews 11.26, explain what that meant in this context. Others may say, well, we're not forgiven of the sins that we practice. Very much related to the willful thing. Lordship capitalizes on that statement. Yet others might say, We are, we are forgiven of the sins that we desire to stop, right? And this, the silliness goes in all several different directions. So we're starting to get a pattern here where we see that this is nothing really short of 
uh, soft law or cheap law. It's a disrespect from the from the God who gave the law concerning Christ being the only one that could do something with the law. And by faith, we establish the law by saying, yes, Christ is the only one that could do really something with it in a, in a holy and just way. Magnify it, satisfy it, honor it. So we're starting to see... Uh, in, in these statements, I believe, a pattern of conditions required. So these conditions, we have to see, are against the offense of the cross because the offense of the cross shows that there is only 100% sufficiency in the effectual work of Christ to pay for and put away sin. So when you start adding conditions, you're saying Christ is not enough. This is obvious. This is automatic. So this is when we lean on and rest in the sanctification in the blood of Christ, which the first sanctification of the Father points to, and then the testimony of the Spirit in sanctification points to Christ and Him crucified. So, some might think that they had this problem figured out through their repentance. But then we need to ask some of these questions. Do we realize that repentance does not take away sin? I mean, flat out, repentance does not take away sin. Repentance does not bring forgiveness. Do we realize that repentance does not cover sins? Do we realize that repentance is not in any part a payment of sins? Do we know that repentance does not mean that you stop sinning? I think that might be the biggest fallacy that people hold to, that repentance means stop sinning. If that's what that means, nobody has ever repented. I heard Ray Comfort make that statement one time in, on video in evangelism. He said, repentance means stop sinning. He just condemned himself. In his evangelism, what he did there is he judged by the law and he condemned himself because nobody stops sinning. So after all these questions, does this mean that the Word of God doesn't talk about repentance? And seriously? I mean, of course it does. But it talks about it in, in the biblical way, which is the more rare way that, that nobody talks about this, this proper Christian life when it comes to repentance and it comes to confession, it comes to living by faith. Because true believers are in the minority concerning, first of all, what the gospel is, and all the particulars and implications concerning the gospel in the Christian life utilized as our primary focus, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we do things, we rest, already realizing we're already accepted in the Beloved. And so there is a Repentance, the scripture talks about a repentance that needs repented of. So it's a false repentance, it's a legal repentance. It's a repentance in the mix of false religion. I know uh, we had a conference here a few years back, and uh, Jason Booth did the message on, um, excellent message on 2 Peter 2 24 through 26. It was called Gospel Repentance. And this is the idea. It's turning from idolatry, dead works, former religion of self-righteousness, pride, and turning to serve the true and living God by faith under the dominion of grace without conditions. Free, full, full, 
assurance in Christ based on Him alone. So this is where we can look at and kind of understand more when we hear these verses like um, having a form of godliness but denying the power of it even turn away from these. So there in 2 Timothy, that's 2 Timothy 3.5, Paul was warning about these religious types that were legalists. And from the outside, they look all cleaned up, they look moral, and they try to exercise power. And they, they to, to the masses that don't know the gospel, and they're looked at, it's like, ooh, this guy's godly, he's, he's ethical, he's moral. And he has more validity in what he says. And he can manipulate by fear and so on. With, he can wield that power that way. And there again, he, and those teachers, they ruin lives. You know, Paul and some of the other apostles said, um, and there in the Galatians, you know, it said... Um, these people are wanting to glory in your flesh and put you under the law, the law that they're not even keeping themselves. Why are you even listening to them? Let's, uh, let's end with uh, James 2. And look at verse 8. James 2, 8, If you fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, which is you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you have respect of persons, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So in other words, if you have respect of persons, you're violating the royal law of doing to others. You know, I had a conversation on the phone yesterday with somebody about this idea of, I think, what everybody has in them by nature, how that, and it, and it varies depending on how a person was raised, how that we look upon others Unbelievers and believers have this in them. And of course, believers used to be unbelievers, and it's hard to get this out of them. But how that we look at others, and we size everybody up, right? What's the warning we, we've talked about several times? We're not to compare ourselves among ourselves with ourselves. It's not wise. Christ is a standard. He's perfect. And when we're pressed and humbled and crushed to see, I don't meet up to His standard, and we're brought down low, in reference to us and God, then we are to turn around and put that in practice in reference to each other. Easier said than done, right? So as we, as we live life, depending on especially maybe our influences of, of who trains us or who we hang around, whether in the home, at the workplace, friends, whatever, you see this idea of, of and you've experienced it yourself, that we automatically, by nature, size everyone up. Even currently, First of all, there is, I want to just talk about a good practical aspect of that, which is good. And, and this, is, this is by sight, too, and, and this doesn't always work. But if you're going into a place, a public place, you walk into this big whatever room or whatever, whether it's a restaurant or whatever, and you kind of just at a glance, does everything look normal? Is there anything out of place? Maybe automatically there'll be, there's a table over there and those people look like trouble. I'm out of here. 
I mean, that's, that's wise. That's, an, that's the idea of automatic sizing people up. And they, that might be accurate by looking at them. Maybe it depends on, the, maybe they're rowdy. It's a little bit more obvious. But when it comes to, I mean everything, everything without exception, related to what your goals are. Some people talk about their dreams, right? Uh, and, and this is all layered with what do I want to do? What do I want to put my time in? What trends am I involved with? What clothes am I wearing? What do I want to look like health-wise? What do I want to do? I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. So then we have these logical fallacies in our head. So if this person over here is, is telling us something, and he tells the truth, are we going to be biased and say, well, you know what? You're, you're, a ho you're a homeless person. You live under a bridge. How can you tell me truth? A lot of times, automatically, people look by sight and they think, that you're not valid. You're homeless. Or somebody has done something wrong in the past. And he's renowned for doing something wrong in the past. Whether he stopped doing that or continued to do it, no matter what. So he says something, you say, that can't be true what he said, because look at what he's done in the past. That's, that's a logical fallacy. Or, you know, um, this person is crippled in a wheelchair, and they can barely talk, and people would write them off. We'll look at them, and they're in a wheelchair. There's all kind of wicked things that people impose on people that has nothing to do with truth. It has to do with sizing people up. This is this idea of a respecter of persons. God sizes us up in Christ. As Christ is... So are we in this world. Can you imagine if, if God would mark iniquities right now on us and size us up outside of Christ? Where do you think we'd be? <laughs> right? So bring that into this idea of, look, you claim to be a believer... You claim to have this thing straight in your mind between you and God in reference to sin. Count yourself to be dead to sin. Count yourself to be separated, holy. Now look at your brother and sister and do the very same thing. Don't do this comparing yourselves among yourselves with yourselves because it's not wise, which means what? It's foolish. So this idea of respecter of persons is a violation of God's commands. And we continue to do it in certain ways. Even if we don't express it, we're thinking it all the time. It comes out when, we, I mean, you're driving, you know. Who does he think he is? That guy pulled in front of me. I want to wring his neck. You know, those, those type thoughts. Or somebody's, somebody's walking down the road and they're wearing something that you don't think is cool or whatever. <laughs> Look at that guy. You know? Happens all the time. I mean, all I got to do is look at my old pictures. Some of my pictures from the sixth grade. Maybe from the 90s. Wearing certain kind of pants, wearing certain kind of glasses. I, I think I'm going to throw that picture away. Or maybe my mom will post something on Facebook of me. Uh, get on the type. Hey, mom, can you take that down? <laughs> so we even size ourselves up from the past. When in the past we thought we were cool 
and we've changed, even changed our mind about ourselves. We've got some problems is what I'm getting at. We have sin remaining in our lives, in our minds. And this is the battle. Pick it back up, maybe, maybe next week in this same area in James. There's a, there's a couple of things in James I want to deal with that are connected to this. That I think are important. But do we see the importance of of ha- having our minds balanced to the scripture that is already balanced? The scripture is true. We just got to conform ourselves to the truth of scripture. And, and how does that play out? The renewing of the mind. Every time the mind is renewed, it's calibrated. Right? And is that progressive sanctification? It's called growth in grace. That's what that's called. Growing as an already sanctified person. Any comments or questions? All right.